Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. Uh, I hope that it's encouraging to you and inspiring to you. I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into the scriptures. And I hope that you're able to do that with some people around you, with some community. Um, but if you don't have that, we would love to invite you into the community here at Restore. If you want to take a next step, get more connected, you can just go to restoreaustin.org slash connect, fill out a card on there, and I will personally reach out to you in the days after you do that. And if you want to grab coffee with me or just get more information about the church, I will make myself available to you for that. As you will hear, we are in this thing called a year around the table, and it really comes from this vision that God's given us that Restore would be a place where anyone has a seat at the table and everyone experiences the extravagant love of Jesus. So A, I hope that you experience the extravagant love of Jesus as you check this message out. And B, if you don't have a table to sit at, we want to invite you to Jesus' table here at Restore. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know we've been in this series called Part of the Family. We just saw the little bumper video about it. And in this series, we've been using the Lord's Prayer as this manual for what it looks like to be a part of the family of God, kind of walking through it verse by verse. And that's because this God-designed prayer given to us by Jesus is really our guide as we pursue the way of Jesus together. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount in which it's found is, but it's really especially what the Lord's Prayer is. I've mentioned a few times throughout the series that um, I played football from seventh grade all the way into college, and that every team I was on knelt down and prayed this prayer before every single game. Did any of y'all ever do this? Why don't you raise your hand up? Any sports teams? Any, any? Okay, you did this a little bit. Maybe not at a football game, but you've probably said the Lord's Prayer out loud somewhere at some point. Okay, have any of y'all ever noticed that something kind of strange happens at the end? I first noticed it when I was a seventh grader, saying the prayer in the locker room before a game. Everybody would be going strong, like 90% of the prayer. But then the participation would drop dramatically for the final line. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Have you noticed this? Okay, I didn't know why. Um, I kind of, you know, we knew we were all supposed to, like, get together bow down, get on our knees. And the big part of prayer is obviously when you're a kid, your eyes closed, right? Like that's super important. You're supposed to have your eyes closed. But this kept happening where like the last line of the prayer, people wouldn't say it. So I broke the rule. I opened my eyes because I wanted to see what was going on. Now I'm no Sherlock Holmes, so it took me an entire year to figure out what was happening. But I finally figured it out. The Catholics weren't saying it. The Catholics were not saying the last line. Now, since about half of my fellow players and coaches were Catholic, that meant about half of the people were not saying and finishing out that Lord's Prayer. They'd keep their eyes closed and their heads bowed, but they were quiet during that last line. I found out much later, in seminary in fact, that Catholics don't say the last line because there's some controversy about the last line. Some controversy about whether Jesus actually said it or not. Most of the oldest manuscripts of the Lord's Prayer don't include this line. So most Catholic translations don't either. Some Protestant translations do, including the King James and the New King James, which have been kind of the most widely used Protestant Bible translation since the KJV was first published in 1611. But many modern translations, in fact, most modern translations, Protestant or Catholic, no longer include this line of the Lord's Prayer. Or they include it with a little kind of asterisk next to it about it not being in the early manuscripts. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Why on earth did you just talk about that for five minutes? That was really boring. That's fair. Well, I did it because we've been working through this Lord's Prayer line by line. And I imagine that most of you are at least some point following along, maybe on your phone or your Bible. And maybe you've got your NIV or your NLT or your NASB or your ESV or your ESPN. And you're working through all those. I made the last one up. That one's not real. But if you're following along in most modern translations, you aren't going to have this final section. And I honestly just wanted you to know why. So we are actually going to include it, though, at the end of this series today. So why include it if we aren't really sure if Jesus said it or not? Well, two reasons. 
Number one, because it's still a part of the kind of colloquial Lord's Prayer, the thing that we say all the time that many of us have, have memorized and that we say in public settings. It, it gets said normally, so that's reason number one. Reason number two, though, is because whether it was in the original prayer from Jesus or not, it is still an important truth that is testified to by the teachings of Jesus and really the whole of Scripture. So with that said, let's dive into this final line. It says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that word thine, it's an old English word, hence its use in the King James Version. And this old English word denotes ownership or belonging. Today we would say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But thine is capitalized here in in your Bibles because it's a reference to God. You see, it was and still is a common practice to end Jewish prayers with a line of blessing. So this final verse serves as a kind of doxology to the Lord's Prayer. And it really simply means that the kingdom, the glory, and the power all belong to God. And that if we get to participate in any of those things, if we get to participate in the kingdom, if we get to to share in the, the glory, if we get to receive some of the power, it is only by God's grace that we can do that. It belongs to him. And he has graciously given it to each of us, opened his arms up so that we can participate in it. Now, it's different from the rest of the prayer because it's not a calling or a command. This is simply a recognition of reality, an acknowledgement of the truth that the power to live as a radically diverse and inclusive family comes from God. The glory that comes from bringing heaven to earth is reserved for God alone, and the kingdom that Jesus came to inaugurate is wholly of God's design. This has been such a a fun series. I've loved walking through it with you all. So I want to end it today kind of by dreaming together a little bit, by exploring what this kingdom of God could look like and does look like, what it would mean for us if we really leaned in to this calling to be a part of God's family and to bring little pieces of heaven to earth. What would the result be? A few weeks ago, we looked at the part of the Lord's Prayer that says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I showed you this kind of series of graphics depicting the meta-narrative of Scripture. That is God's great story and our place in it. And it all started with heaven and earth united as one. That's what it looked like at the very beginning. No distinction between God's space and our space. But... We wanted our own space. Represented by Adam and Eve, we said we want to go kind of our own way. Humanity wants to do its own thing. And so God granted it. And just like that, God's space and our space are driven apart. Heaven on earth now becomes heaven and earth. These two spaces are separated. And without God in our space, the earth quickly descends into violence and chaos Murder, oppression, and war become commonplace in this new earth space. And after heaven and earth are separated, the Bible begins giving us distinctive characteristics about these two places. See, heaven, God's space, is filled with justice and mercy and goodness and beauty. But the earth is filled with sin and injustice and pain and evil. But even though we've rebelled, even though we've turned our backs and said we want our own space, God hasn't given up on us. So God brings heaven and earth back together, this slight overlap. You see, he starts making covenants with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and all the people of Israel. They were promises that that God would bless all humanity through this certain family, this certain group of people. And he is slowly but surely reuniting his space and our space. But if you remember what happened, if you know some of the biblical story, there was one big problem. Humanity breaks every single one of these covenants. God keeps making new covenants, and we keep breaking them. But just when it seems like God should be completely finished with humanity, he takes this reunification plan to a whole new level. He puts on flesh as Jesus and comes to earth to himself fulfill all the covenants that we keep breaking. Humanity couldn't do it, so God became humanity in order to fulfill our end of the covenant. Think about it like a handshake, right? 
God and humanity shaking hands. Every single time one of those covenants was made, that's what happened. God says, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I need from y'all. And every single time, humanity would break it. We needed a human hand to keep the side of the covenant. So God puts on flesh as Jesus comes down and essentially shakes his own hand to make his covenant with humanity fulfilled. And so now there's this permanent overlap between the two spaces represented by the cross, that is Jesus. See, Jesus left heaven and came to earth so that he could bring heaven to earth, that he could create an overlap that would never be broken. And Jesus spends his entire time, his life on earth, helping people experience little bits of heaven. That crossover is a truly beautiful place. Crossover. I just got that. You like that? Cross and a crossover. Some of you are with me on that. Yeah, it's a pun. All right, stop. No more dad jokes. <laughs> he spends his whole life, Jesus, on earth, bringing little bits of heaven to earth, forgiving sins, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, setting the oppressed free, welcoming the stranger, and loving anyone and everyone he encounters. And he spends so much of his time talking about this thing called the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. He tells story after story about what God's space is really like. He makes these declarations, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then, after dying on the cross, conquering death, coming back to life, Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of everyone who wants to follow him. And you see, you not only now have the, the cross in the middle, you have these little crosses as we begin to carry the kingdom with us wherever we go. As God indwells every believer through the Holy Spirit, he makes us into little overlaps between heaven and earth. We are representatives of his kingdom, tasked with doing his kingdom work here on earth as it is in heaven. That's why I said a few weeks ago that being a Christian isn't about going to heaven when we die. It's about being used by God to bring heaven to earth here and now. That's the primary responsibility of following Christ. Because you see, God isn't abandoning this world. He's restoring it. And he's tasked us with being a part of that restoration process. But finally, he has given us a window through which to see what this fully restored place will ultimately look like. It's called the new heaven and new earth. It's where God's space and our space fully reconnect and God's kingdom is fully realized once again. The overlap is back, and this time it's permanent, full restoration. All sin and injustice and pain and evil are gone forever. God's space and our space are fully unified once again. But that's to come. You see, as Christians today, we exist in this in-between space. This in-between space. Not yet the new heaven and new earth, the kingdom fully realized, but the kingdom has come and it continues to come in and through us. We live in between. So back to dreaming together. What would it look like for God's kingdom to come in your life and in my life? What would it look like for God's kingdom to come in our families, in our relationships, in our partnerships? What would it look like for God's kingdom to come in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our world? Well, thankfully, we don't have to dream alone. You see, this fully realized kingdom of God called the new heaven and new earth is described primarily in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And it was given the name Revelation because everything in it is what God revealed to a guy named John in a dream-like vision. John was dreaming. And we get to dream with him. And honestly, y'all, it's depicted with such beauty and detail. I just want to spend the rest of our time together just walking through the description that he gives us. So if you have your Bible and you want to or your phone, you can open with me, Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. But the verses will also be on the screen if you want to follow along that way. That is totally fine. Then I saw, so that's what, this is John narrating, so the I is John. He is in this dream space. God is showing him this vision, what the world, this fully restored, reunified, fully realized kingdom of God is going to look like. Then I saw it, 
John says, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. No longer any sea. That's kind of a weird thing to say, right? Like we think of the ocean as like a cool place, right? A lot of us go to the ocean. We like boats, things like that, right? That wasn't true of ancient civilizations. The sea was the scariest thing imaginable, right? Think back to Genesis 1, if you know that story, right? It talks about that the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters, and there was chaos, and there was darkness, right? It's this ocean-type thing. And then out of that, God creates the world. He creates Eden. It's the same thing here. So what John is saying when he says there's no longer any sea, he's not saying there's no longer any water because we know there's a, a river that runs right through the center of the new heaven and new earth. He's saying the most dangerous thing imaginable no longer exists. And I heard, or excuse me, I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's that God space and our space reunified once again, back together. John sees it. And here's what that space looks like. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. You see, you and I, we live currently in a kingdom. We live in a few kingdoms, really. We live in kind of societal kingdoms, cultural kingdoms. We live in kind of the kingdom of of Austin, if you live here, or Texas. And, you know, living in Austin, Texas is difficult because you have the kingdom of Texas and the kingdom of Austin. They're fighting with each other all the time, right? (laughs) We lived in the, the kingdom of America, We live in kingdoms. We exist in kingdoms, but those are passing away. Those are passing away. The old order of things is leaving. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is restoration. Not destruction and recreation. God isn't destroying the world. He's making it new again. He's returning it to what it was always supposed to be. He's returning me and you to who we were always supposed to be. I want to show you one other amazing thing. You may have seen in that behind me or on, in your Bibles that there are quotation marks around a few different phrases in that passage, starting with a new heaven and new earth in verse 1. A lot of times there are quotes around that. Now, remember I said Revelation is this dreamlike vision given to John by God. Well, in this vision, John was shown that Jesus was coming back to complete his mission of restoration and, and what the restored world was going to look like. But in order to describe it, In order to write it down, John does the same thing he does throughout the entire book. He uses pictures and images from the Old Testament and from the world in which he lived, similar to what you and I would do. If we got a vision from God and somebody asked us to describe it, we would describe it in the world in which we live, right? It looked like this. We would use scripture, this kind of defining narrative that shaped all of our lives in some way. We'd say, well, it's kind of like this when this happened. This is what John is doing here. That's why there are quotation marks in these verses, because John names this reuniting of God's space and our space, the new heaven and new earth, which is a borrowed title from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. So let's go there for a moment. If you'll listen closely, you'll recognize a lot of the language John just used in Revelation 21. So here's Isaiah speaking for God in chapter 65 of his book, and he predicts the very thing that John saw in his vision. Again, I want to just read through it and soak it up together. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. I I love this verse. So many of us have triggers. You know what I'm talking about? Not if you know what I'm talking about. We have been through difficult things in life. We've experienced trauma, right? Right? And when we see that trauma, we see something that makes us think of that trauma, we, we get triggered by it, right? So a lot of times it's a physical reaction. I start sweating a lot. I mean, I sweat a lot all the time. But 
when something happens, like I get, I get triggered, I, I sweat, I get hot, I get tense, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. The former things will not be remembered. This is those traumatic events being wiped away. How beautiful is that? The things that, that trigger us now, the things that bring that trauma back to mind in an instant, that will not happen anymore in the new heaven and new earth. They will not even come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. Talk about triggering a second ago. I know that's triggering for some of you. I know some of you have experienced this, experienced the loss of a child. Maybe after the child was born, maybe before, maybe miscarriage, things like that, things that we don't talk about a lot. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not live out his years people we've lost way before their time. That's not going to happen anymore. The one who dies at 100 will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. This is a dramatic verse. No more debt, no more servanthood, no more slavery. No longer will any of us be a part of systems where we pour into them and don't receive much back. That won't happen anymore, the new heaven and new earth. We will reap what we sow. Everybody will. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. This is a reversal of the curse in Genesis 3. It's done. It's over. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. I love that. Before they even think about reaching out to me, this God who dwells with them, I will be there to meet whatever need they have. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. This is that old order again. It's over. Domination, marginalization are no more. There are no more prey and predator, not just in the animal kingdom, but in the human kingdom. This is over. This is done with. Did you notice that the lion will eat straw like the ox? There'll be no more killing anymore. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. All of this is God's kingdom, fully realized in the new heaven and new earth. It's like our world now, it's just perfected. It's a place where the old order of of subjugating some people so that others can thrive is done. Everyone thrives in God's kingdom. No one works for anyone else. No one owes anyone else anything. No racism or sexism or classism or any other oppressive isms exist. No oppression of any kind. We are all completely and perfectly whole and equal the way we were designed to be. It's a place where death and all the things that death brings, sadness, bitterness, mourning, pain, they're done away with. It's a place where there's no more war, no more weapons, no more hostility, no more violence. It's a place where everything is defined by something the Bible calls shalom. It's this beautiful Hebrew word that means perfect, abundant goodness for every person and in every relationship. It's not just perfection in all things, it's perfection between all things. 
And I know it's fun to dream, right? But one downside of dreaming like this is that it makes us long for it kind of in a really hard way because we know that we're not really experiencing it now, right? It makes us want it. It makes us miss it. It makes us sad. It makes us tired of wading through the brokenness that this world is. But I want you to know that God's kingdom, it's not just our hope for someday. We aren't confined to only dreaming about it. We carry heaven with us wherever we go, and we are called to bring little pieces of it to earth by fighting against oppression, by by sharing joy, by pursuing equality, by ending violence, and by awakening everyone to the abundant goodness found in Jesus. We may live in between Christ's resurrection and his second coming, but we are not paralyzed here. We are not immobile We can be a part of making it come here on earth as it is in heaven. We must not resign ourselves to the brokenness of this world. We must not shrug our shoulders when we see people hurting and just say, well, someday, someday, that'll be better. We must not be content to let suffering and injustice be commonplace. We have been given the power and the calling to do something about it. Jesus said, this is how you pray. Pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is to be not just the words on our lips, but the motivation of our heart that moves out into our hands and into action in this world. When I think of God's kingdom made manifest here on earth as it is in heaven, I always think, I always think about a table, a big banquet table. See, there's a bunch of different metaphors used to describe God's kingdom throughout the Bible. It's a a city made of gold, a garden with a never-ending river running through it, a mustard seed that starts small but grows into this huge place of safety and refuge, a treasure worth giving up everything to find. But the most often used picture for it is people gathered around a banquet table, a huge party with all the best food, the best wine, and the best company, Isaiah, that same prophet we just read, speaks of a banquet like this. He says, on this mountain, remember, it's the mountain he just talked about, on this holy mountain. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. He will forever remove all insults and mockery against his land and his people. The Lord has spoken. Jesus uses the same banquet table to describe the fullness of God's kingdom in his story about the prodigal son. He does it again in his story about the wedding feast. Even Revelation, where we were earlier, it talks about this great wedding banquet for the Lamb of God. In fact, on the night before Jesus lays down his life on the cross, he's eating a meal with his best friends, and he tells them a day is coming when they will eat together in the kingdom of God. Here's what he says. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This is that in-between. You know, the Jewish people had been eating the Passover meal together every year since God had used Moses to free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. But on that night, Jesus changed everything. He told them that he was about to die and be raised to life again. And then he also told them that someday they would be sharing a meal around table in the kingdom of God. Being a part of God's family means we live in between these two meals. The Passover meal Jesus shared and this banquet in the kingdom of God. 
And as we said, during this in-between time, we are not to remain passive. We are certainly not meant to sit and gorge ourselves. We are called to invite anyone and everyone to the table so that they can have their needs met and so that they can experience hope and joy and peace and grace and unconditional love right alongside of us. This is why our vision here at Restore is to be a place where anyone has a seat at the table and everyone experiences the extravagant love of Jesus. No matter who you are, what you've done, or what you've been told, you and everyone else have a seat at Jesus' table with your name on it. No matter who you are, what you've done, or especially what you've been told, you have a seat at Jesus' table with your name on it. Anyone who tells you something else is lying. I think my favorite description of this table comes from the one and only Beth Moore, Mama Beth. She says it like this. One day, all of us in Christ will sit around an enormous table exquisitely set with a feast of rich foods prepared in divine kitchens. No one will be left out. No one will be alone. No one will be nameless. No one unknown. No one with nowhere to go. We will finally be home. What a beautiful picture of God's kingdom in its fullness. I can't wait, y'all. I can't wait until the day that that becomes a reality for all people. But until my very last breath, I'm not going to stop trying to make it a reality for every person I meet. Here and now, not just someday, but heaven on earth right now. That's what we're all about here at Restore, and I think that's what it means to be a part of God's family. Would you pray with me?